this mid-morning session uh, is going to be uh, hosted by uh, Anne Sorensen and Volker Bruchert, uh, and uh, the session title is Carbon Sources and Sinks. I'm going to remind you that after this session at, at 12 o'clock, um, there will be ACES, the Department uh, of Environmental Sciences and Analytical Chemistry, will have a lunchtime seminar in the Alman room, which is where the streaming is. And it's completely fine to take your lunch, take grab a lunch and go in and listen to that. Um, and that lunchtime seminar um, is aerosol climatic effects in extreme environments. Thank you. So now I hand over to Anne first. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for coming to this uh, session on carbon sources and sinks. Uh, first of all, we were really happy to get a lot of abstracts for this session. So that also means that unfortunately not everybody who wanted got the opportunity to speak today. But instead, there's going to be posters outside uh, that also relates to this session. So if you didn't have the chance to go to the poster session yesterday, uh, please, in the uh, in the lunch break or if you're going to the seminar in one of the other breaks, go around and look at the posters as well. There's uh, a lot of uh, great uh, science related to uh, this session there as well. Um, otherwise, I think we should get started. We have six different uh, talks on the program uh, and we'll start with Yannick uh, talking about uh, a database for uh, Arctic rivers. <coughs> <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, so yes, my name is Yannick, and I'm a PhD student at ACES. And the database I'm going to talk about is about Arctic uh, ocean sediments, uh, not rivers, unfortunately. Oh, <laughs> That's no worries. Um, so I will talk about the Circum-Arctic Shelf Sediment Carbon Database. Uh, which is a large-scale assessment and huge effort to understand the large-scale influx of terrigenous organic matter to the Arctic Ocean. And why should we bother about terrigenous organic matter in the Arctic? Well, we know that the northern hemispheric permafrost region holds a huge carbon pool, about 1,300 petagrams, as current estimates state. And uh, if you think of climate change and permafrost thaw changes in the cryosphere, uh, this carbon pool is under pressure. And there are two dominating pathways that were identified by previous research of how this carbon of permafrost is predominantly released. And first of all, we have permafrost thaw at the surface. And there is an increasing number of papers now showing actually uh, evidence for increasing permafrost active layer depth uh, from year to year due to increasing Arctic temperatures. And what's happening there is that we have the permafrost active layer and the increasing thaw depth makes that the carbon, which is previously freeze-locked, is turned over by microbes, and this emits, emits CO2 and methane in situ. But there are also lateral fluxes resulting from that. There is uh, water, a lot of water in the Arctic, uh, which um, then results in the large Arctic river web, and this sort of integrates and drains uh, the huge areas in the Arctic which are covered by permafrost soils. So a lot of that carbon that's thawed out by surface permafrost thaw ultimately also ends up in the Arctic Ocean. In the Arctic Ocean itself, we have another phenomenon which is very, um, very predominant and very uh, well known, and that's the uh, erosion of Arctic permafrost coastlines. And this sketch actually illustrates of how that is supposed to look, and this is a nice picture of um, of an Arctic coastline which is uh, under climate pressure. So we see actually uh, huge ice veins and ground ice in this Arctic permafrost and uh, it's actively eroded. And this happens in parts of the Siberian Arctic but also in Alaska. So those two dominating, uh, as previous research has shown, dominating uh, carbon release mechanisms uh, cause transport from the permafrost region to the Arctic Ocean. And uh, previous research has used uh, carbon characteristics, so carbon concentrations, but also carbon isotopes in Arctic Ocean sediments to trace back where the carbon comes from, and that to a large amount actually comes from permafrost. So as we've seen, there is a risk for release of CO2 and methane, uh, the so-called permafrost carbon feedback. And, um, that there might be also other 
um, mechanisms and other sources of carbon we have to think about. And uh, one of the purposes of this project, the Cascade, is it to bring uh, the knowledge from, from this. So active layer thaw, coastal erosion uh, at a Pan-Arctic perspective. So there are also other, uh, other regions in the Arctic. So this, this region here in the Eastern Siberian Arctic has been studied massively during the last couple of years. Uh, but there's also other regions which we sort of lack in understanding of what are the larger permafrost carbon pools which actually contribute uh, to the permafrost carbon release. Uh, this, this map shows you the distribution of so-called ice complex deposits. Ice complex deposits are those permafrost coastlines. Or this, is, this is what is happening, those permafrost coastlines, those deep um, ice-rich and carbon-rich cliffs uh, is what happens if this ice complex deposit permafrost is actively eroded. Uh, and this is deep and very old permafrost deposits that uh, developed during the last glacial cycle in the Arctic regions that were not covered by large ice sheets. So you see here in Alaska, but also here in Siberia, uh, Western Siberia a little bit, um, those, those regions have these ice complex deposits, whereas other regions were covered by glaciers, uh, none of those deposits. And then we have peatlands in other regions, such as in the um, Canadian Arctic, but also in the Western Siberian Arctic. Uh, peatlands evolved a little bit later, not during the last glacial, but after the last glacial, uh, at the beginning of the Holocene. Uh, and then this map also shows you the distribution. Actually, it's, yeah, you see that this darker gray shades here. Here you see a little bit non-permafrost part, but this darker gray, so basically the whole uh, circumarctic land region is affected by permafrost. So what we can say and conclude to this end is that the Arctic Ocean is the main sink of laterally transported permafrost carbon. And uh, previous research has used uh, the relationship between the carbon isotopes 13C and 14C to understand the source of carbon from uh, permafrost being transported. Uh, and as many of you probably know, 13C we can use um, to differentiate between carbon that was sequestered in marine organisms uh, and, and land-based plants. Um, and uh, the 14C acts complementary in a way that we understand whether the carbon is rather contemporary or strongly pre-aged, so it is old or young. And if we now think of what are the main carbon pools in the Arctic, permafrost, uh, marine organic matter, um, and if we, if we bring this into this uh, dual isotope plot, we see that the, uh, we can actually differentiate between the individual sources. Uh, so marine organic matter has the um, delta 13C value around minus 21. And then on the terrestrial side, we have a variety of differently aged uh, terrestrial carbon pools. The youngest and most contemporary one being the uh, surface of the permafrost. This is soils uh, under, uh, as, I, as I told you, under climate pressure. So the soils are thawing out material, which is relatively young compared to the other permafrost uh, carbon pools which we see in the Arctic, such as the Holocene aged peatlands. So um, this delta 14C scale here would translate into a 14C age of roughly 10,000 years. Uh, and uh, then we have the old Pleistocene permafrost, those actively eroded cliffs uh, in Siberia and Alaska uh, with ages of 20,000 years or higher. And then there's also petrogenic or fossil carbon uh, in certain regions of the Arctic. Um, which also have been shown to actually contribute to carbon in Arctic Ocean surface sediments. Um, and uh, what we can then do uh, is if we have a total organic carbon of a sediment given, yeah, for example, maybe one or two percent in many marine samples, that is actually the case. Uh, and then we, if, we, if we know the delta 13C and the 14C, we can do a source apportionment. We do mass balance and can actually calculate the individual fractions. So. What does Cascade now do? Cascade, uh, Circumarctic Shelf Sediment Carbon Database, is a collection of surface and downcore data. Um, and it includes data that has been generated over the last couple of decades. There are many studies in the Arctic Ocean and in the Arctic region actually focusing on uh, marine sediments uh, in the individual shelf seas, but also in the deeper ocean basin uh, that have been using those indicators, those um, parameters to understand the source of the organic matter. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, very important is the organic carbon concentrations, but then we have the delta 13C and delta 14C, as I showed you in the previous slide, and the N ratios, and also terrestrial biomarkers that we use to understand source, but also degradation. Um, and I will walk you now through some first results of Cascade. So I, I should mention that, so this is um, based on data that has been generated over the last couple of decades. So um, I think the earliest records go back to the 50s and 60s. Uh, but when we started this mapping exercise and started mapping out all the data that was available uh, from our and from other uh, databases, uh, we could identify major gaps. And we, were, uh, we started new collaborations with partners and actually filled those gaps so that we have a nice sort of circumarctic perspective on carbon isotopes and source, sources. So uh, very briefly now through the results, um, this is the Delta 13C distributed over the Arctic Ocean and uh, those brown shades here indicate where we have major input of terrestrial organic matter and this distributes around the major Arctic rivers. Uh, here in the Kara Sea, for example, Opienisei, we have the Lena River here along the East Siberian Arctic continental margin um, Kolyma River. This is also a region where we have this coastal erosion, as I showed you before. Uh, and here is the Mackenzie River, um, indicating major terrestrial organic matter input. Now, if you look at the Delta 14C, so we see how old is the carbon. We see that in the Siberian Arctic, again, so this resembles the region of where we had huge terrestrial organic matter input. The carbon that is transported to the ocean there is relatively old. Uh, while here in the uh, Canadian Arctic is very old. So it's close to actually uh, minus uh, 1,000. So th those values are around minus 800, minus 900 per mil. Uh, however, here in the Western Siberian Arctic, um, the, the carbon in the surface sediments, even though we saw that there is terrestrial imprint quite a lot, uh, the carbon is relatively contemporary. So if we go now back to our source apportionment and remember of um, the individual sources and how they distribute in this dual isotope plot, we can um, map out and we can um, actually map out where the major sources, what the major sources are in the individual regions. And these are uh, very preliminary uh, source apportionments that I will show you now. So it's very preliminary. We're still discussing uh, the individual end members um, for the individual regions. Uh, so this shows you where marine organic matter uh, is very important, um, but the more, more, more important stuff is, of course, the terrestrial carbon. That's why we um, did this whole uh, source apportionment. And we see that those green areas here um, indicate organic matter from permafrost active layer material um, coming into the Arctic Ocean. And we see here in the uh, Kara Sea, uh, this dominates the surface sediments in the Kara Sea. And in the other parts of the Arctic, uh, those red shades indicate uh, ice complex deposits. So this is coastally eroded organic carbon. And here we have uh, a strong imprint of uh, petrogenic carbon. So major rivers, and these are the sources. Um, and what we also like to understand are the fluxes. So we use down core information in individual uh, cores, couple that with organic carbon concentrations in the sediments and uh, mass accumulation rates. And then we can actually understand of how much carbon is transported every year. And uh, the takeaway message, and I think I'm running out of time here, is that permafrost active layer uh, and ice complex deposits are the two dominating uh, sources of terrestrial organic matter in the Arctic Ocean. So future ways for Cascade um, are first uh, a database paper, which we will probably submit to Earth System Science Data. So this is an open access uh, format and discussion uh, journal that will briefly describe the database. And the second paper is something where we will perform this source apportionments and provide a sort of a big picture of terrestrial organic matter input to the Arctic Ocean. And the cascade will be available uh, on the Bullin Center database. Yeah, I'm happy to take your questions now. Thank you, Yannick. It was a very nice presentation. Thank you. We have time for two, three questions. From the standpoint of climate, the most important thing is how much of this carbon delivered to the ocean gets oxidized or respirated into CO2 and how much of that you know, makes it into the atmosphere. So are there any estimates on how much of that will be buried and essentially sequestered versus being accessible to, uh, to turn, turn in, to mineralize into CO2? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, that's, that's a very good question. Um, and there are estimates on this. Um, one way of doing so would be incubation experiments, but there is also other estimates. And uh, a recent estimate um, says that about, I think, 60% of the organic matter, um, so about, let's say, half uh, of the organic matter is respired and emitted as CO2. So when I presented you the fluxes, that is probably only half of that was, that was originally uh, released from land to ocean. But, 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 but some of that that remains that you actually see as the net flux, some of that will also get uh, respired over the next 20 or 100 years. Also, in situ degradation in the sediment is, yeah. is an effect, of course, that we, yeah, on the long run have to take into account. But at the moment, our database doesn't allow to make that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, just a follow-up from, from uh, Ray's question. Uh, how far w are we from getting uh, a uh, budget also incorporating the, the uh, sink, the, the carbon sink in, for instance, uh, warming creates more, uh, more primary product productivity over the tundra and, and those things. So, so what's interesting for the climate is the net flux, how much is bound and how much is, is, is given off. How far are we from assessing that? A, a, a sink in the sediment you're talking about, or no, the sink in the in the biosphere. So we have, of course, understanding of how much carbon is stored in the permafrost soils, um, or maybe I don't 100% well, understand I'm, the question. I'm, I'm asking about the uh, the the net the net flux. So so there is there is respiration and CO2 is, is given off. Yes. So there's also maybe a greening or there's more vegetation. Oh, okay. so, the, 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 so the balance between those two, which is, which is what the climate c cares about. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the remaining grand challenges we have. Uh, understanding of what actually happens in the Arctic uh, is also to take into account the greening of the Arctic, yeah. Um, but I'm not uh, fully an expert on, on the topic of uh, how far we are away from actually having the big picture. Maybe someone else wants to comment on this. Um, is there a way of knowing if these, of the, if these fluxes are changing? So those fluxes, uh, and the, one of the slides that I now rushed through uh, showed uh, sediment cores, and those sediment cores are rather shallow, so they integrate over a period of um, the last 150 years or so, mostly cores dated by lead to 10. Um, there is also other uh, cores available, radiocarbon dated cores, and those allow us to look into the history. Uh, so let's say at Holocene time scale, so even back to the last deglacial. Um, but it's very hard to compare. Um, and also those shallower cores, they, they integrate over a certain period. So um, I think to this end with the sediment uh, proxies and cores and time series that we have, it probably doesn't allow us to give a decadal sort of perspective on this, or not yet. Okay, thank you very much, Yannick. Thank we you. have to move on. <laughs> so our next speaker is John Prithridge from MISU. And he will talk about eddy covariance measurements of surface atmosphere CO2 in the high Arctic. Okay, hello. Um, so I made a slight change to the title of my talk. Um, so I've added in some of our recent methane results as well as the CO2. Okay, so this little, uh, this little panel here gives some kind of brief context to this talk. So the Arctic Ocean, relative to its size, is quite a, is a significant a large sink of CO2 from the atmosphere. And it's because it's a productive ocean and it's cold. Um, but also, as well as being a relatively large sink, it's also the, the magnitude of this sink is very uncertain. And this is primarily because we have very few measurements, both of the surface ocean concentration of CO2, which is driving the exchange, and of the flux itself. So that's what this talk is going to be looking at. OK, and when I say flux uh, from water to the atmosphere, there's several ways of representing that. This top equation is one of the more common ones. So the flux is equal to K, which is uh, the gas transfer velocity or some kind of exchange coefficient, 
multiply by the solubility of CO2 in seawater times the partial pressure difference of the CO2 between the ocean and the atmosphere. And if we want to kind of model this exchange, make predictions or you know, parameterize it, the part we want to know is k, the exchange coefficient. We want to determine what that is. Uh, it's often parameterized itself in terms of wind speed, but in sea ice regions, we also need to take account of the sea ice kind of uh, reducing the exchange. Often uh, the flux or the gas transfer coefficient is scaled by the, linearly by the fraction of open water in sea ice regions, but there are some models which predict enhanced gas transfer in the presence of sea ice due to the enhanced turbulence caused by the sea ice itself. Now, as well as water atmosphere flux in the Arctic, there's also flux from the atmosphere into the sea ice itself. The sea ice is permeable to CO2, um, primarily through brine channels in the ice. And uh, this is a very temperature dependent process, but it's also dependent on the condition of the ice, whether there's snow cover, whether there's uh, the thickness of the ice and so forth. Um, the equation for this is similar. Um, we can model it like this uh, with the, just the addition of this R factor, which is the brine volume fraction. Okay, in terms of what we do in this talk, uh, we are making eddy covariance measurements of the flux. So this, very briefly, is a direct measurement of the flux itself. Um, we measure the fluctuations of the thing in question that we're interested in. So in this case, it'd be the CO2 mixing ratio, C. And we measure the fluctuations of the vertical wind velocity, W, and we correlate them together. And if we do this at a fast enough rate and for a long enough period to capture the full range of turbulent fluctuations, then we do indeed measure the entire flux. Uh, so typically for 10, 20 hertz for about 30 minutes uh, is sufficient. Um, we normally make these measurements at some height on a tower, say at 10 meters above the surface, but it's the flux through the surface itself, whether that be water or ice that we're really interested in. So we relate the two by making a conservation of mass argument and by then analyzing by modeling the footprint of the of the uh, measurement we're making. The area of the surface that we're interested in that's contributing to the measurements we're making on this tower. And of course, if we're measuring the flux itself using eddy covariance, and we also measure these other parameters like the partial pressure of CO2, then we can directly determine K, the gas transfer coefficient um, from our measurements. Okay, so that's what we do. And this is where we normally do it. This is the Swedish icebreaker Odin. Um, and we've run a eddy covariance gas flux system on Odin um, during its summer Arctic expeditions every year since, uh, well, most years since 2014. Um, the primary component of this system is LGR um, FGGA cavity enhanced spectrometer, which is positioned at the base of Odin's foremast here, and it pulls air down from the top of the foremast, and we measure CO2 and methane with this spectrometer. At the top of the mast, we run this uh, heated anemometer, which measures the wind speed, and we correct those wind speed measurements for the motion of the ship. Now, this is a unique system. This is the only um, operational gas flux system running on any icebreaker. And there's very few running on any ships as well. And one of the reasons for this, the challenge in making these measurements is that a large platform, such as Odin, such as any ship, distorts the airflow, um, which biases the measurements. And we work with experts from National Oceanography Centre in the UK to run a CFD model of the airflow over Odin from a variety of different wind directions so we can determine the bias um, from the presence of Odin itself to the wind speed, to the wind height, to the wind direction and correct for it. Okay, let's see. Okay, so I'll move on to some of our measurements. So these are methane flux measurements measured during the Suarez C3 expedition in 2014. This is an expedition to the East Siberian Arctic Shelf, kind of looking to characterize what methane emissions were coming up from seeps, from kind of melting hydrates on the, in the shelf seas. So we ran our flux system here, we measured the methane flux, and in this central map here, you can kind of see each, each of these measurements, and most of the time, the flux we're measuring was very low, around 0.3 milligrams per meter squared per day. Um, but we did measure the flux over some of the seeps that were encountered. And these are these kind of yellow points here. And there the flux was much higher, up to around 600 milligrams per meter squared per day. If we zoom in on one of these uh, areas, you can see it here. So while there were some very high fluxes measured here, the seep areas, the flux areas here, were very spatially limited. The typical kind of area of one of these seeps is around 
100 square meters. So actually, from our measurements, while the seeps were very high, they actually make an insignificant contribution to the flux that we measured over the broader area, uh, much less than 1%, in fact. So most of the flux was measured from this low but widespread kind of diffusive flux coming up from the, uh, from, uh, the shelf seas. Uh, now, although our measurements are just a snapshot in time and in space, we can extrapolate them to the whole East Siberian Arctic shelf and we can get an estimate for the methane emissions coming up from this shelf. And that's the one shown here, three kilograms of methane per year. And this is similar to some estimates derived in different methods, but also much lower than some other estimates. Okay, so as well as the methane flux, we also measure the gas transfer velocity during Swerus, and that's what's shown here. So on the x-axis, we have wind speed. On the y-axis, we have the gas transfer normalized by temperature and salinity. These dashed lines are a couple of parameterizations from the literature, kind of well-established values. And our CO2 measurements, which are shown in blue, agree quite well with these parameterizations, which is reassuring because this is often not the case for ship-based measurements. Our methane measurements are shown in red, and some of them agree quite well. And then there's these couple of higher bins here as well. And these are from actually periods when Odin was sitting facing a seep with the flux footprint over the seep itself, measuring a very high flux. But then the waterside methane concentration is measured at Odin, which is away from the seep. Um, so we get this kind of disparity here. And it shows, again, the kind of spatially limited nature of some of these seeps. So those, that top plot was gas transfer measurements in open water. This is now gas transfer measurements in sea ice, uh, which we, we did for the first time in the Arctic. So here we have sea ice concentration on the x-axis and then the gas transfer normalized by open ocean values on the y-axis. And again, our kind of CO2 measurements here suggests that either a linear scaling or perhaps a slight suppression of the gas transfer rate in sea ice um, is appropriate in contrast to this, this grey shaded region, which is one of these models predicting enhanced gas transfer in the presence of sea ice. OK, I'll change tack slightly and move on to more recent results. So last year on Odin, we went on an expedition to close to the North Pole here, um, where Odin moored to an ice flow. So here's Odin's mooring. This is the ice flow at Mortu, and a lot of meteorological instrumentation was deployed on the ice flow. In particular, um, measurements were deployed at this far area here, which we call the open lead measurement site. At this site, I built this, up this flux tower here. So this is a similar uh, to the kind of measurements we make on Odin's foremast. Apart from here, I'm only measuring CO2 with this non-dispersive uh, infrared gas analyzer. Reason being that everything at this site had to be run on battery power. I should mention this instrumentation was funded by the Blind Center. Okay, so we were fortunate during this expedition that the, uh, the open lead remained open for the majority of the measurement period, roughly a month. Um, but it was a very dynamic environment. So this schematic here shows uh, the dimensions of the open lead, which I measured with a laser rangefinder, and they varied throughout the, um, throughout the period. And then this, the red lines are a flux footprint model um, measuring the contributions uh, to the flux. And this varies mostly with wind direction. And then the plot on the right is a climatology, like an average of all this over the, uh, the measurement period. And I can use these measurements to, in effect, determine the open water fraction, the proportion of each flux that's measured with uh, a water surface as opposed to an ice surface. Okay. So this is a time series from the open lead site. The top panel is wind speed. You can see several low pressure systems passed uh, during the measurement period. We had 30 minute average winds up to around 13 meters a second. Uh, the second panel is the uh, partial pressure of CO2 measured in the open lead at about half a meter depth. And it remained under uh, significantly undersaturated throughout the uh, experiment is by about 80 parts per million. And then the third panel is this, this kind of footprint analysis, this open water fraction. You can see, roughly speaking, the first half of the experiment, we're measuring mostly fluxes over the water surface, or into the water surface, I should say. And for the second half of the experiment, we're measuring mostly fluxes into the ice surface. And for the purpose of this talk, what we're really interested in is the fluxes into um, the water surface. And to, to determine them, we need to take these ice flux measurements, derive a simple model for them. They're very low, so we just do a simple temperature-dependent model for them. And we can use that to, uh, and this equation up here, to determine what the flux is into the water surface. And from that, we can determine the gas transfer velocity into the open lead. And that's shown here again with wind speed against gas transfer velocity 
and the red line is the regression to our measurements. And we see it's similar but slightly suppressed relative to these open ocean parameterizations. I think this is due to the limited fetch in the open lead. Um, and I'll just, in fact, move on to the conclusions. So, yes, so the main finding from this experiment was the gas transfer was suppressed, which has uh, significant implications for the, uh, the global, uh, for the polar carbon budgets, the polar CO2 uptake. I just want to highlight we had this unique trace gas flux system on Odom. We've done five expeditions to date, two this year. The cruise track shown here, and we're building up a large database of these uh, direct CO2 flux measurements, and there's several more expeditions planned. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you very much, John. Very interesting. Questions? To connect this with the, the previous talk, I'm wondering, has the Odin, have you ever done eddy covariance measurements in these coastal regions where a lot of organic carbon is being you know, delivered to the ocean to see if you can get uh, you know, directly detect the, uh, the, the remineralization carbon flux from this organic carbon? We, so the Suarez expedition is shown in this kind of red color. So that was qu quite close to the, uh, the kind of Russian coast. So we certainly saw, yeah, <laughs> I guess it's debatable how close, but um, it va vaguely close. Um, and they certainly saw in the water side measurements this kind of these riverine inputs. Um, I guess in most of these, whether we could distinguish them in the flux measurements as such, uh, haven't done that analysis in enough detail to say, yeah. basically. More questions? If that's it, thank you very much, John. Thank you, Nicholas. Our next speaker is Anders Alström. And this is uh, an invitation that we have extended to merge at Lund University. So Anish is coming from Lund University and uh, tells us about the work they do in their climate program. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invite. So um, I was asked to do something that related to the Polin uh, Center. So the first thing is uh, my co-author on this work, which is Gustav Hugelius, sitting here of the Polin Center. So this is, uh, I kind of forgot to change the title. So this is basically a work with a model that has been developed, a global ecosystem model that simulates the carbon and vegetation and uh, vegetation and soil carbon and all the fluxes or very many fluxes and, and pools of, of the terrestrial ecosystems so or land ecosystems globally. Uh, and and uh, in this work, we are basically changing And this is the um, EPG guest model. So it's the Lund Potsdam Jena General Ecosystem Simulator. Anyways, so it's, uh, uh, I want to start with how we normally do modeling and uh, that procedure. So what we normally do is that we have some kind of model. Here it's uh, basically a, a figure of the carbon cycle, just the pools and the fluxes we have in LPG gas. And we normally run this model uh, and we get some kind of result. It can be a time series or a map or something. And we then evaluate to benchmark this model result against some kind of observations or some kind of data set. And then we kind of say, well, this is a good model or this is uh, not a very good model. And then we do future projections and analyze the model results and so, and so on. And this kind of evaluation is something we say, we kind of want to use the best models and so on. So, uh, but it's still very difficult to do this. It's difficult to do correct benchmarking. It's difficult to know uh, where the problems are in the model and so on. So what we did in this study is that instead of, of basically comparing this way and we're simulating everything dynamically, where we basically only have climate inputs, in this case, we basically put the observations in the model 
So we force the model directly with these observations. They are not really observations. On a global scale for the carbon cycle, we basically have no observations. What we have is various data sets that are model results based on local observations. And there's a ton of problems with doing that. So just to say, when it says observations, it's not really observations. It's maybe observation-based data sets or something like that. So this is what we do, and to do that, uh, we use something called a traceability framework. So this is the only equation I'm going to show, but uh, basically this is work with, uh, by Ji Chi Lo and Jing Yang Sha of uh, Oklahoma University. They are not there anymore, but when they were there. So basically, if we look at this uh, equation, it looks very complex, but what it does, it's a matrix, uh, matrix, matrix equation, it can basically represent the whole model structure in time also perfectly. And, and what makes it possible to do this is that basically all models, it works not only on LPGS, basically all models, all carbon cycle models, as far as I know, have this structure. And the basic structure is they have these fluxes in the pools, and the, the, the fluxes from a pool is regulated by first order kinetics. Uh, so that basically means, so it, it's a, it's a, it's a it's basically a concept from chemistry from the beginning, so it's, a, it's like a linear reaction. But in carbon cycle science, we can basically say it means that the flux from a given pool is proportional to the size of the pool. So basically it means that if we increase the size of a pool, we increase the flux. And there's a couple of variables there. So that's basically key, and you also see that in, in the equation here. So the change in a carbon pool, or it could also be the change of your bank account, is basically the influx, how much money you get in or how much carbon you get into the pool, and then it's the turnover rate multiplied uh, by the pool size. And when these two terms um, have equal size, then you get a steady state and you have some amount of carbon in there. Anyways, this is the second thing that relates this very much to the Boleyn Center. This is not a new idea. Actually, uh, this is a paper by Bat Boleyn and Eric Eriksson from 1959. I bet somebody else did this before, but they basically did this. This is how they built basically global carbon cycle models. And what, what I have in red there is their land, uh, basically the land carbon cycle. And at the time, I think people put m more effort into the ocean carbon cycle, and it was later revealed that maybe we should also look a little bit on the land carbon cycle. But uh, as you see there, they also have two pools. Or they also have pools and they have the same kind of structure and they solved it, this equation in the same way. Now it's a little bit more complex because if you compare here, they have two pools, we have, I don't know actually how many, very many pools. So now it's become much more complex. And, and the second idea with using this is because models are so complex, we as modelers don't really even understand what they do. So even printing out all the data so we can see what actually happens in the model just creates terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of results that are, you know, it's super hard just to analyze how a model works. So that's basically the second uh, good thing about this method that you can better understand what's actually happening. So anyways, this is just to demonstrate it. So this is where LPGA guess. So, uh, we basically apply this equation, so we print a lot of data, and we basically populate very many small equations for every time step. It's, it's not that interesting, the actual way how we do this, but anyways, it works. So what you have in, in the red is basically a uh, guess. The original simulation, we only force it with climate and so on. And in green, we have these uh, traceability frameworks. You see some offsets. It's, it's basically perfect for every pool. There's some, some problems, and those problems are only the spin-up. It's because we have a very tricky nitrogen cycle that kind of mess up our carbon cycle a little bit. It's very difficult to do a spin-up. Anyways, that's the technicality. On the right up top there, you see the global, basically global carbon, and it tracks it perfectly, and then you have per grid cells, a so locally one-to-one -one line. It's perfect. So we can basically take this simple equation and we can represent all the pools and fluxes and everything that happens in the carbon cycle in the model 100% perfectly. Uh, so what we can do then is the whole uh, purpose with this is that instead of, for example, using our MPP, it's the net growth of plants, it's basically the uptake of carbon from the atmosphere. It's about 60 petagrams per year, so it's like six times our emissions. It's, it's a large flux and this is the net growth. 
it's uh, about half of photosynthesis globally uh, per year. So we can basically take uh, our model one, our simulated one, uh, where we, well, it's kind of difficult to simulate this. And instead of using that one, we put some kind of observations in there. So in this case, uh, and then we can basically solve the whole global carbon cycle for every location, and we can evaluate the model. And what we have to the right there is an example of time series, basically of the, of, of the net terrestrial uptake of carbon, uh, which is around two petagrams or three petagrams, something like that. Uh, so what we do, we use a couple of data sets. So for MPP, we, we also create some data sets because some of them are GPP, which is the... Uh, which is basically more, more uh, similar to only photosynthesis without the losses of, from the plant's uh, respiration. So we have like, I think we have six of those. And then we have uh, soil carbon. Uh, so we have two of those. And from the soil carbon, we can basically calculate turnover rates. So that's in this first order equation, it's the turnover rate. It's basically the fraction, basically how long it stays, the, the mean residence time or the inverse of that. Anyways. And then we do the same thing for vegetation carbon. So we have from, from for example, from satellites and so on, uh, or field es estimates that they have upscaled to global maps. We also have vegetation carbon. So we also calculate our turnover rate for those. Anyways, and then we evaluate the model. So in this case, we evaluate spatial patterns. We basically make a whole map into a, a vector, and we run a, a, like a correlation or something. Uh, analysis on that. In this case, we have something called uh, index of agreement. Uh, it's just something that scales from zero to one. One is good. And what you have here is the agreement between uh, model and data in blue after we replace MPP. We have the agreement between model and data in red, uh, which is our original model. And then we have also the agreement between the data sets. So there's probably better ways of doing this, but what we want to say is basically there's three cases uh, so the red dot there, the red patterns, for example, is we actually have a higher agreement between the model and the individual data sets than the data sets have between themselves. So what does that mean? It's, uh, I think it means, it's very hard to say what that means, and I think a, a statistician can probably come up with a better metric, but it basically means a model is better than the data. But you can't really say that. But we still say that in this paper. So it basically means... When we are above that line, how can we say a model becomes better? Right? What's our target? What's our true target to make our model better? It's very hard to say. Because we have, we have no room to improve the model and evaluate it and say, hey, we got a better model. Maybe we can change this metric and, and we will get slightly different results. And then we can do this for different regions globally. And there's only one here in the semi-area. It's actually where we see that we have room, so the original model is below this line, very low scores in vegetation carbon. And then when we change MPP in this case, we get a better model that's above basically the confidence we have in some way in the data. We can do this with soil carbon, very similar results, uh, more or less our model all the time. It's better. I can't really say it's better. I don't have a perfect word for it, but we, have, we can't really evaluate that the model becomes better anyways. Uh, we can also do this with uh, um, global, global uh, net carbon sink, basically estimated from the global carbon budget. And uh, that's uh, like an independent uh, global estimate of, of the net carbon sink. So the total amount of carbon taken up or released by vegetation and soils globally. And we, get, we can just combine all of these various ways to correct it and so on with, with soil carbon turnover, vegetation turnover, and we get like 90 or 100 different model results. And on the right there, you see basically in the color, not the red one, the red one is the original. Our models basically uh, agreement with this independent data set. And then the various realizations. And in blue, you see that's the best one. So basically we can, when we just pick the absolute best realization out of these 100, we can get something that's much better than the model. But it's a little bit tricky to see. They also have these whiskers that are below the red ones. It basically means that sometimes we don't improve the model when we replace the data. In very many cases, we make the model worse. Uh, and this is basically spatially where we make the model worse and so on. But I need to uh, go to my conclusions. <coughs> 
So the conclusions of all these technical work, I think, is basically what the people have known for a long time, but we may be putting a different words to it. So the progress, uh, when we try to make better carbon cycle models for the land, is, is partly the uncertainty in the data sets. How can we evaluate if a model becomes better if the data sets are so uncertain? And sometimes, in many studies, you see you only compare to one data set, one reference, and so on. And that really doesn't give us the full picture. And I think we need to do uh, much more benchmarking of observation-based data sets and basically come up with a way to find a better target for our models and then evaluate if our models are becoming better or worse and so on, if they're working. Yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. There should be room for discussion. Thanks, that was an interesting uh, talk. What about erosion and removal of soil? So, so that's, uh, <laughs> I've been interested in that in a very long time. So that, that, that can disrupt quite a lot of our calculations, uh, depending on the size. So we, we do assume a closed system. So um, basically, if the erosion leads to a very different turnover rate, so for example, it de decomposes much slower or much faster than it would have done in the soil, then we would need to include it, and these results, yeah, we would need to include it, or, or the results would change. But if, if, it, if it has the same turnover rate, then we basically capture it, but because nobody really knows yet. So I think that's very interesting with erosion and getting a number on, on the balance, just as we heard about the questions here before, the balance of those, uh, of, of that carbon too, yeah. Just a quick following up. When we are tuning a model or we are calibrating a model, we can do that on what we call monitoring data. But we can also do that on experimental data where we have made disturbances of the system to check whether the mechanism are correctly described. To what extent have you tested the model on those type of, we can call manipulation experiments with disturbances? So I, I think uh, that you touch on basically one of the conclusions. This is what we should do. And you can do that almost globally too by looking at functional relationships. So uh, we have done that. And maybe this, this uh, I, I agree very much. But we, it's still valuable to look at large scale patterns in the real world if we can, right? So I think we should combine these. But I think that's one of the messages, just doing this very normal comparison to a data set is not that valuable. We need to look at the functioning, basically how it responds to CO2, temperature, changes, and so on. That, this is, I, I agree 100%. This is what we, basically what also this study highlights, I think, yeah. Thank you very much. We have to move on, so. <laughs> and our next speaker is Perik Jansson from KTH and he'll be talking about the understanding the seasonality of climate change for impacts on permafrost, snow, and greenhouse gas emissions in Arctic seas. Okay. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I was also happy to listen to the previous talk. And there was one citation was Erik Eriksson and Bert Bolin, 1959. Erik Eriksson was my supervisor in hydrology. So I was proud to see that that is still in the memory. <laughs> uh, my background is that I'm a hydrologist and I made my PhD at Uppsala University and was the professor at uh, Agriculture University and that was on agriculture water management and then later on at KTH and water and resources. But anyway, uh, I have always been interested in climate, even that I think that I'm mostly a soil scientist. And today I will speak about one study that I've been doing in collaboration with a young Chinese student of myself that works with the LPDGS model, but further continued studies on Greenland, 
and then he shifted to use the model that we have been developing more focusing on the soils. So, uh, what's the maps here? Yeah. The background, I would say, a little bit like general. When I started, we did not have many models. We developed a number of models. And we had two different societies, one with data and another with models. And sometimes we met, but it was quite tricky. Today, we have a lot of models and we have also a lot of data. So we are in an area where we should like to make contribution by taking them together. And I would like to emphasize now the carbon and the carbon budget of an ecosystem. And then we can say that in principle, the carbon is, of course, based on some few principles, as was also demonstrated in the previous talk. But there is one issue, and that is that we have two fluxes that are quite big. We had the input and we had the output. And both are driven sometimes by the same forcing factors. So it is easy to go and mix them and say that, okay, if temperature goes up, photosynthesis, growth goes up, but also decomposition goes up. And how could we know about the difference? How could we know when we enhance one factor more than another? Of course, we can look more closely in the textbooks, and we can, of course, say that this you know, light is not so important for the microorganisms. And of course, the conditions in the soil are much more important for the microbes that are making the decomposition. So very easily we can say that if you are a plant, you have one beneath soil surface environment and one above. But if you are a microbe, then you are mostly only beneath. So that's a basic assumption. And those we have in our models. So the model I have been working with, and actually I sometimes feel ashamed to say that, but I started to develop that 1975. So it's quite long history. But if you look to the upper left, you have the coupling of water and heat. And I used to teach that we need to understand not only the water, not only the heat, but how they are connected. In the same, we can say we could not look to climate as a driver for the vegetation and for the microbes, because we know that there is an interaction, there is a feedback. Also, the vegetation creates a climate. It creates a climate in the above gives, um, conditions in the atmosphere, but it also creates, of course, the climate in the soil. Today, those two models, one with the vegetation and carbon and nitrogen, is also connected with more detailed models for looking especially to the N2 emissions and methane emissions. And that is, you know, not the same type of feedbacks, but still both are closely connected to the other two models. And it's easy now to say that we can play with these models. We can combine them in different ways. Sometimes we only run one component, sometimes we put them all together. I will demonstrate data now from one specific study. And that's partly a unique study, because as far as I know, it's the only edifax measurements that have been done throughout the whole year in the Arctic. In most cases, in the Arctic conditions, people have been measuring mostly in the spring, summer and autumn, but not covering the full year. And we had a long discussion whether this whole year should make a big difference. Those measurements are here on the eastern coast of Greenland. And, sorry, western coast of Greenland, I mix that up sometimes. 
Okay, anyway, it's a vegetated area. We have permafrost conditions. It's not a peat, but we have a number of peat conditions and we have an organic layer. And we know quite precisely about the conditions there during five years. And what we do is then, like many other models, we try to tune them, so we calibrate them. <laughs> and then we have data every 30 minutes from this Ediflux tower. But we have also data representing the soil temperatures, the soil moisture, and soil carbon. <laughs> so most of the data are independent input or possible to make what we call multi-criteria calibration. So of course we would like to know the CO2 flux, the net CO2 flux, but we can also constrain it on <coughs> other components. This shows only how the model fits with the CO2 flux. The net CO2 flux representing both the photosynthesis and the respiration. And you could see in the uppermost to the left that you have a type of diurnal cycle, uh, sorry, <laughs> annual cycle. Oh. So the annual cycle is reflecting both the short growing season and the relatively long winter season in this particular environment. And if we make a scatter plot, you could say that it's a mess. It's always a mess. But if we look carefully to the residuals, we can see that the model has been quite nicely representing it. The, the residuals are normally distributed. The residuals don't have a big bias within the days. The residuals don't have a big bias within the yearly course. So it's a relatively good calibration. <laughs> but I, I will not try to discuss the R square or such things, because both measurements and model are wrong. I fully agree with Anders here. <laughs> Sometimes we say that the model is good for checking the re reliability of the measurements, because it's very tricky to measure those things, and especially in these tough conditions. What might be interesting to see is that one particular winter, the outflux, the respiration, is higher than all the rest. Oh, sorry. Oh, we, we, we continue here. Oh. If you now look to the right, then you see the accumulated carbon flux from those five years. And you could see this particular winter where you have the blue line that goes up substantially during a long period before it drops because of the photosynthesis, and then it goes up again. For all the other years, they are on a much lower level. So the most important differences was actually because of, of uh, the winter conditions. The summer were more regular. To the left, you have the full budget, uh, as has been expressed during those five years. But now I would like to also quickly make the next step, because this is what we can do by looking to the model during one particular period. But we can also look to a longer period. We can look to 30 years. And when I look to the 30 years, we should of course be interested to see what happens during such a long period if we can trace, for instance, the climate change? And in this region, it is quite interesting that you know, the climate transition is very st strong and rapid. We have a shift from minus 7 degree to something like minus 2. So we don't need to speak about scenarios. We can speak about the historical data. And we could check how the conditions are responding to that. 
What's obvious is that those rapid change in the air conditions are not reflecting in the soil. The soil temperatures does not have any connection to that, more or less. No. This is the active layer. That increases. This is how the growing season shifts. And this is how the soil temperatures shift for the same period. Oh. And finally, we can see the water content and we could see an uh, indicator for the respiration, how that varies with time. And here we have my final slide, sorry. <laughs> it shows that the carbon is here accumulating in the soil. And it's accumulating in the ecosystem. The nitrogen is depleted. And the nitrogen is the crucial issue for the long-term budget. We do not get a type of explosion or towing from a permafrost. The permafrost does not contain something in itself. It is the soil and the carbon. And the soil turnover changed drastically when we changed those climatic conditions. So we will be more efficient as a sink. We will not create source conditions. That's my message. Thanks. Oh. Thank you very much, Pam. We have room for one short question. So do you think that your main message as found in this site in Greenland would be applicable to a site where the deep sowing permafrost was very, very carbon rich, which is this not in this site as far as I know it? Mm. The main message is that the things are happening in the uppermost half a meter. If you are towing the permafrost at 10 meter steps, you could create land slices and you could create a number of phenomena. But the basic principles between the photosynthesis and the respiration does not change with that. The carbon balance is mostly a type of strong interaction with what is happening with the plant and what is happening in the decomposition in the uppermost, I would say, 30 centimeters sometimes. It's not deep. It is shallow. Okay, yeah, we can oh. <laughs> discuss that further because I very much no, don't agree. Oh. But. Oh. Oh. Thank you very much, Pierre. So we move on to the next speaker. This will be Edouard Pesquet, who will talk about the adaptive role of lignin in plants to ensure geobiogeochemical cycles of carbon and water. Edouard is from DEEP. Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Edouard Pesquet and I have a group which works on, on a different perspective. And each time I come to the Bolin Centre talk, I'm very nervous because I, I'm not going to talk about the ecosystem. I'm actually going to talk about subcellular component within plants. So it's nice because the previous talk be, I've been able to introduce a bit the topic and I'll show you as a cell biologist and a molecular geneticist what we think the overall carbon cycle and water cycles are, which are just basically, as we've seen, a net flux between organic carbon and uh, mineral carbon. And this is based on the anabolic and catabolic capacities of the organisms in the biosphere. And all of this process is associated with water. And for plants, it goes for a water going from a liquid state to a vapor state and back and forth. And this creates a specific condition for plants to be able to evolve and adapt their biomass. So we've seen this already in the previous talks, is that this net kind of relationship between the mineral carbons and the organic carbon is a notion of flux, of rates. 
And in the case of the plant development, we are interested in the respective anabolic activities of the plants to build up their biomass, how this biomass is in the rest of the ecosystem going to be catabolized, what is the lifespan of the organism within the biosphere, how do they grow, how do they develop, and how accessible is the biomass, the different sources of carbon. So we're working on rates. And when we look at where all this organic carbon is, and if we would take the entire biosphere and grind it up to you know where is the carbon, it's essentially in plants. So you're seeing we've got a huge proportion for 450 gigatons of carbon within plants. And 80 to 90% of this carbon is allocated in one specific cellular component. And this cellular component is called the cell wall. So you can see the cell wall here. It's surrounding the entire cell. And you can see it all around. And cell walls are extremely important because bacteria, archaea, as well as fungi, also have 80 to 90% of their carbon located in cell walls. And this year, the Bodine Center uh, helped us to organize a meeting dedicated on the understanding of the cell wall. So this cell wall, it's a composite material made of huge types of insoluble polymers. Some are semi-crystalline and have tensile strength to the equivalent of steel for nanometer wide structure. So this is a compact but dynamic element. And the organization and the composition of the cell wall depends on the plant species, on the nutrients, on the developmental condition, the accessibility of water. So the entire state in which the organic carbon is placed is going to vary with the environment. So when we look at plant cells, uh, we can see that different cells adapt their cell wall, therefore the allocation of the photosynthetic carbon, to different places of the cell wall. Most plant cells, you can see in this scanning electron microscope, they have these outer structures of the plant cell wall. And if we would section through this, we see that we have a thin cell wall of about 150 to 250 nanometer. But the higher plants also have specific cells where they can store huge amount of carbon, such as these cells here. And when we look in their cell wall, they have thick ribs of secondary cell wall, which can be 10 to 50 times thicker than the primary cell wall. So you've got specific sites within the cell which allocate huge amounts of carbon. And these have been very important in plant evolution because 450 million years ago when plants shifted from a water to a land-based environment to sustain the dryness and the loss of density of the air, plants have adapted specific cells with high secondary cell wall content. And you all know these cells, they form, for the higher plants in the biosphere, both a vascular system and a skeletal system. You all know this as wood, and we've got wood everywhere. But wood is also in a grass, it's in every single land plant that you're looking. It's just a different proportion. And from a cell biology point of view, this is wood. So what we've got is cells, and these cells, in order to be functional, are dead. So we've got dead hollow cells, and we just have the cell wall present. And these dead cells are assembled end to end and have different organization of the secondary cell wall. So they can organize based on developmental, climatic, and nutritional condition, the allocations of their biomass differently. And this is in order to enable, for sure, where is the carbon going to be stored, but also, how is the water going to be used during the plant growth? So both the carbon cycle and the water cycle are based on the development of these specific wood cells. Basically, water through the plant goes through a negative pressure from the roots to the shoots, and we have these specific wood cells which are dead and form these thick cell walls in order to sustain the negative tension. They can distribute the sap and the water throughout all uh, the vascular churn throughout all the plant. So we've got this great kind of structure. And most of the time, we think the adaptability of plant is quite limited. But they can actually change how they are going to configure and organize their secondary cell wall based on developmental condition. 
And they can either make very porous, lowly uh, accumulating with cell wall cells, when you've got lots of water which is available, or restrict the porosity of their vessel, and therefore accumulate even more carbon. This will for sure change where is the carbon allocated, but also the growth of the plant. So what we have is this cell wall made of cellulose, hemicellulose, and an other type of waxy structure on top of it, which is called lignin. And these are quite important because I say they correspond to 80 to 90% of the carbon of all plants. And we can see that they're distributed in three different categories. Cellulose, which forms microcrystals which have the tensile strength of steel, quite tough, but they can still be a bit degraded. Hemicelluloses, the glue that links the cellulose together, that's more soluble, that's even easier to degrade. But then you have a waxy impermeable layer, which is called lignin. And lignin has been specifically evolved by plants during the colonization of the biosphere. So in my team, what we work is in reverse genetic engineering. So exactly like any reverse engineering, we take, for example, this computer, and I'm going to break it apart and saying, oh, is this component important? And we do exactly the same thing with plants, except we knock out genes. We take them away. We take one, we take two, we take three, four, five, up to 20. And you can see here, what we've got is two plants. These two plants are exactly the same age. One has been reverse engineered to remove seven different genes associated with lignin biosynthesis. And there's a plant, it's here. Okay. <laughs> so you're seeing that the overall synthesis of this biomass not only controls the lifespan of the plant, but also the amount of biomass that we're going to have, as well as the amount of water which is going to be channeled. So lignin. You've all heard of this, and most of the time it's used as markers for specific species. For us, basically, we're seeing that it's a mess. It's been more than 100 years we're working on lignin. We don't know what are the monomers. We don't know what are the enzymes that control it. We don't know how it's made, which cell types. We know it's highly plastic. And we can see that we've got multiple types of units which are interlinked with multiple types of chemical substitution. And we have a conundrum with lignin, is that this is a very directed polymer deposited in specific cells, enriched more or less in specific monomers, but it is assembled randomly. So we don't have an enzyme controlling, and this creates a fantastic polymer where no other microorganism can actually degrade it. So what we do is we try to understand how this complexity of lignin has arose. So we take, for example, genes, and this is just a schematic representation of two genes, and we can insert pieces of DNA through the gene to interrupt the gene flow. So they can't be active anymore, as you can see with these little triangles. So you can see we, we can actually compare to our normal plant that we call the wild type, we can knock out genes and nothing happens. Okay, it still looks like a normal plant. And we can stack and accumulate mutations together, and then you're seeing that the biomass itself is reduced. We can use complex uh, 2D NMR to be able to see how is the lignin change, do we have changes in composition, and changing these different genes is not altering actually the amount of lignin, it's altering how it's made. And this is quite interesting because we can see that this biomass, if this is I think it crashed. <laughs> I'm very sorry. This was my... Okay. So, I wanted to show you that by alterating not the quantity of lignin, but the composition, we can actually affect the degradability of the plant biomass. So these microorganisms without, within the biosphere can actually more or less degrade. Here, lignin. So... So we're changing around the genetic mutation and see compared to normal degradability of the cell walls, it can be enhanced, not by the amount of lignin, but the type of lignin that we have. So to finish up, it's just to show you that uh, plant cell wall represents the, the large carbon sin, and their recalcitrance, their capacity to be degraded, is directly controlled by lignin. And lignin is 
answering to nitrogen availability, water availability, temperature, and it changes in the composition. So the biomass itself, in terms of the sink of the cell wall, will therefore be directly controlled by the plant to change its recalcitrance. So I couldn't have done this alone. I'd like to thank the Bolin Center as well as my research team. That's it. Nice. Questions? Lots. That's very interesting. Um, microbes and fungi can, of course, adapt as well. Yes. But the, the kind of great thing with lignin is that its polymerization is random. So this is very, very difficult to be able to get uh, an enzyme which will be easily be able to oxidize and adapt to this. So what you're changing is the types of monomers. Uh, the textbooks initially, when I started uh, my master uh, in the 1990s, we said there were three monomers. Now we have 87. So, and they assemble at layered structures which are different in terms of density, composition. So you're seeing the, the biophysics of all of this is it's going to be quite difficult for, uh, the, for the microorganisms <coughs> to adapt. Yeah. Just uh, there's sphagnums. Yes. Sphagnum mosses does not contain lignin, according to my textbook. All, all the bryophytes do not have lignin. Yeah. But their capacity to be able to expand yeah, yeah. is much less. Yeah. Okay, so it's true that the turnover of bryophytic uh, biomass is going to be much yeah. quicker. So it might be a more good strategy to survive in some environment, not to, to have lignin. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it could. Yeah. One last question. So I have two, two related questions. When, when you mentioned microbial degradation, but I think fungi also yes. degrade lignin, and, and do the things you said about uh, the alteration of uh, de degradability apply also to fungal degradation? Second thing uh, is, uh, although it would be dangerous, I think, to g gene engineer lignin to be non-degradable and be a, a, a carbon storage, you actually see this as as a remote possibility, or is it something that's actually on your radar screen to develop trees that don't decompose so that they are long-term carbon sinks? Okay, so for the first question, yes, when I say microorganisms are made as well fungi, and we can even extract uh, the hydrolytic enzymes of these microorganisms to be able to be testing. So this is what we use towards the accessibility to the cellulose. We use cellulase and see how much the topology of the biomass is inhibited or not by lignin towards its accessibility. Uh, the second thing, yes, uh, maybe not genetic engineering, but we could do marker-assisted breeding to be able to get plants which have the capacity to accumulate more lignin as a mitigation strategy. So you could basically change the type of biomass. Uh, we don't, in terms of the composition of the biomass, at term, lignin will always be degradable to a certain extent. And this is what we're trying to, to be able to estimate. What are the molecular determinants controlling the half-life? And yes, this could be after uh, helped for selection, but also for agricultural product, so that we could get straws with different types of lignin. And we don't even need to use the genetic engineering. Most of these processes have already been developed by plants in specific environments. So they live in the desert, or etc. So we could go back and re-get a second generation in terms of our crop industry. I think we should discuss this, uh, continue the discussion after the session. And our last speaker of the day is Medi Darvishi, and he will talk about the impact of climate changes on Sweden's glaciers using the INSAR technique. Tarfala. Okay, hello everybody. I'm Mehdi Dervishi, postdoctoral researcher in the Physical Geography Department at Stockholm University. 
Today I'm going to present the initial result of my study with the title of Impact of Climate Changes on Sweden Glacier Using Insaw Technique, recently funded by Bullion Center within the framework of the Arctic Avenue program. First, let's start with the case study and glacier in the Sweden. We started monitoring a region in the north of the Sweden close to the Tarfala research stations, which is composed of five major glaciers, the Robust and Isvala, the figure, and Stor Glacier are the biggest one. The Stor Glacier is a <coughs> polythermal gla valley glacier close to the Tarfala research station. The study on this glacier started in 1947 when the Tarfala research station was constructed. It means that this glacier is probably the most studied valley glacier in the world. The effect of climate change on glacier and permafrost is clear now and proved by the scientists. As you might know, the scientists, the scientists are finding that the glaciers can reveal some clues regarding the global, global warming because the, glacier, because the glacier is so sensitive to the temperature, temperature fluctuations. And this higher temperature causes, this higher temperature causes some, causes the permafrost to thaw. It means that this processor can release many, can release amount of the, let's say, methane and carbon dioxide. It seems that the, the climate change has turned the permafrost to the carbon dioxide emitter. It means that we need to have a powerful tools in order to monitor the effect of climate change on glacier and permafrost changes. As you know, the remote sensing-based data is a powerful and cost-effective tool in order to monitor the big coverage of the Earth within the short time and with the satisfactory accuracy. On the figure on the right, on the top, we can see a glacier on the Alaska in the 1941. And the right one is related, related the same region with the same landscape. And you can see the recent one is related to the 2004. And you can see the landscape completely changed due to the climate change effect. And the other picture in the down, you can see, which is related to the Svalbard archipelago, it shows that the, the recent study shows that the glaciers in the Arctic are shrinking by as much as 300 meters a year. And that's why. It's so important to have a constant monitoring system in order to evaluate the effect of climate change on the glacier and permafrost. Let's say have a look on the glacier status within the Sweden's. And the Sweden's tallest peak lost the climate change. You might have heard this news from the media. It means that the Kepnekaise Southern Peak is no longer the highest peak in Sweden, which is located in the inside the Arctic Circle, 105 kilometers. This, the Kepnekaise Southern or the Kepnekaise has two peaks: the southern part, which is covered by the ice, and the northern one. And the northern one is free ice. And the recent measurement shows that. The, the, northern, the northern one is higher than the southern one. In the, the, the difference almost one meter and twenty centimeters, which is the lowest, which is the lowest height ever measured. Over the past fifty years, the Kepnekaise Southern Peak has been in, has been decreased by twenty four meters. But I think the competition between two rivals is going on, and let's see what's happened next year. We decided to use radar system as a test of visibility to monitor the glaciers 
where this area in order to make sure that this technique is capable of detecting the changes happen or even the, me the measure the height of glacier in this area. In this slide, I will provide a quick overview on the NSAR principle, especially for those who are not familiar with these techniques. The, uh, the NSAR product is formed by acquiring two consecutive images at the same, at a different time, but at the same area. If we have some subtle or even tiny movement on the Earth, this, move, this movement on the Earth manifests itself in the phase shift in the radar images. And based on this shift, we can estimate the movement on the Earth. And this is the idea behind the NSAR techniques. Generally, NSAR techniques can provide two main products, line of sight displacement map and line of sight velocity map. And how NSAR works, when the backscatter signals from the Earth received by the sensor, it's composed of almost six phase components. The first, as you can see here, is related to the flat, Earth flat phase, and the second topography, and the third orbit and atmosphere, and the noise of systems, and the last one is displacement information, which is interested for us to be extracted. But we need to remove the rest and just keep the last one. As you can see in the, the first row, <coughs> which is contaminated by some noise and some, fines and some phases com components which are not interested and should be removed. And you can see, for example, in the first row is the original one, and after removing, removing unwanted phase component, we have some improvement. For example, after removing flat earth phase, and this is after removing, after removing topographic, and after removing the orbital, and after removing the atmospheric phase, and here after removing all these red cross components and unwrapping, and here we have the displacement map. So now, here the case study on the image on the right, and the SAR data we used in data processing was Sentinel-1A and B, which is the C-band sensor, with a time span from June 2017 to August 2019, with the time as, with the requisite time of six up to 12 days, depends on the Sentinel-O, if you want to use the Sentinel-A or B, but with combination of two satellites, we can have the image with the release time of six days, including 133 descending mode and 135 sending mode, including both polarization VV and BH. And here you can see in the center of the scene, this is the ore case study, including ore glaciers, and the green rectangle is related to the extent of the image in the descending mode and here you can see the satellite pass and here shows the line of sight of the satellites. So, and the red rectangle related to the ascending mode. If we want to have 3D displacement vector, we need to combine two different SAR geometry mode in order to extract or decompose its displacement vector. If we can do this, then in the final product we have the displacement vector on the west and east and down up on the object on the surface. And here you can see the initial result. The result superimposed on the high resolution national dam of Sweden's two meters. Here we can see the line of sight displacement ascending. The blue color with the positive value means that the distance between the sensor and the object on the surface is increasing and the opposite is the case for the negative value and the red color. And here we can see the result of for descending mode. After combining two 
star geometry and decompose, decomposing the displacement vector, here we can see the displacement west and east and displacement in the vertical dis displacement down and up. And you can see the total displacement, for example, for this side of the glaciers is increasing and for this one decreasing. It means that how much glacier loss or gaining in the vertical directions. And this, for example, shows that this part of the glaciers is moving to the east and this part is moving to the west. And here we have some results extracted value on the cross section on the, where the glaciers and you can see, for example, the, the rate of displacement is not even through the, through the glaciers from the top to the down and you can see the variation is completely different. And, and he, this map, which is most important than the others, shows that the, the, red, the red region shows that this area experienced the mass loss and only these two small parts experienced some gain within these two years. And here we, we can see a quick time series So this is the video file, but I don't know, it doesn't work. Is it the same on the next one? Yeah. yeah, I have two video files. Yeah, it's, it's working now. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so. Maybe it's just slow, like if it's like a big file. No, this one. It's really pure here. Hmm? Oh, you can see the time series from the June 2017. In the center of the scene, you can see the evolution of the glacier starting losing the mass. And you can see we have some other glaciers around the center of the scene. And you can see the changes of the permafrost within two years. And you can see this time that's referring to the date of each data acquired by Sentinel-1 data, almost six days. And you can see we had most changes in the center of the scene. <coughs> and then in the end, you can see the result in the 3D model of the things. You can see here in the middle is Orcasia study, and the red color is referring to the or glaciers, and you can see the valley is almost green, which refers to the stable part. And also we notice that some other glaciers close to Orcasia study here, 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 those experience some mass loss. In the end, uh, the, the result of this study shows that the Sentinel-1 has a great potential for glacier and permafrost monitoring. And INSAR product can provide some input for glacier modeling, ice sheet modeling, and mass balance estimations for other disciplinary. And soft data shows that it's capable with the shorter visit time of six day to provide the high accuracy data in order to estimate the mass balance of the glaciers. And in the next step, we want to validate our result with the grand measurements and then calculate the mass losses of the glaciers for five major glaciers close to the Tarfala stations. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>